Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Sanders uh, from the CICMQ program. I manage it on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Credit Management, and welcome to the 100th Zoom call since lockdown one. 100. Last week, we passed the 2000th delegate. Today, we passed the 100th Zoom call. And I'm very, very pleased to say that we've got Charlie, uh, Charlotte Rose, who's going to be talking to us about this clearly very popular and uh, pressing subject um, called paperless direct debit and if you didn't know what that means, then um, you'll soon you'll soon find out. If there's any other presentation that you uh, should be on, uh, then you're on the wrong one. If it's not this one, okay. So it's uh, great to see everybody on the call. I'm just going to uh, share my screen uh, so that you can. And if you can see this, um, everybody, as we're all uh, muted, etc., give me a thumbs up. Great stuff. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, get everything. Uh, so just some uh, some some very very uh, quick logistics. Um, the uh, my camera is on this machine here, and the presentation is on that machine over there. So if uh, if I'm not looking at uh, at the screen or you don't think so, I'm actually because I'm I'm, I'm driving the presentation to Charlie. So um, welcome to an industry briefing presentation, which is what this is. Um, uh, lots of people have, have asked us about this over the last uh, two or three weeks. Um, and it's something that we thought, ah, oh, right, okay, well, perhaps we can help um, by, um, by providing a little bit more insight into what this stuff is. Um, so um, what we're going to talk about, why are we here now? Um, uh, and and, it's, and it, there's, a, there's a couple of pretty much obvious reasons, uh, one of which is COVID, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I'll introduce um, Charlie to you as well, uh, formally. Um, we're going to be talking about making it easier and better and the benefits of both Audis and paperless direct debit. The planning and roadmap pointers, so there's some, there's some um, pointers as to what you should be doing and what you should be looking for, and also some common pitfalls. You know, that's what to look out for when you're um, implementing um, uh, paperless direct debit and Audis into your organisations. Um, and then if you want, um, we, we've got um, we've got something that we can do as a takeaway at the end of this as well, which we'll talk about in a little while. So if you need any more information, there's some contact details that you can contact um, that will take you through that as well. OK, so let's um, let's let's kick off. So first of all, pre-March 2020, Paperless Direct Debit and Audis has been around for a long time. Um, and it's one of those things that um, is, is uh, the direct debit process generally in organisations has been, you know, it's, it's clunky. We all know it is. It's a manual. Uh, it needs signatures and bits of paper flying around. Um, um, but it's generally been kind of OK. It works. And organisations have spent a lot of time building up their direct debit penetration in their customer base mm -hmm. over a long period of time. Um, so organizations with 70, 75% direct debit penetration, a lot of them have done that through the manual process, which is fine. Um, and it does work. Um, and, uh, and but the issue, the issue with it is it is a manual paper driven process, which is because it's manual and paper driven, it is not what you would call in the new parlance resilient. Right, because the bits of paper will land on a door, a, a doormat somewhere in some office building somewhere, which means someone's got to go and get it. So it's not particularly um, helpful um, for organisations to have a manual process like that. So, and what happened in lockdown? And we saw this with a number of our um, uh, CICMQ organisations and other clients as well. What happened in lockdown was that. Um, organizations, uh, as we all know, suddenly started being very, very focused on their cash flow. Um, and in many cases, smaller organizations as well as larger, but and sort of medium, medium sized businesses, national businesses started thinking about, well, how can we retain cash and manage our payments, our outbound payments um, a little bit more um, uh, in, 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 in the time frame that we wanted to do. So they start. So lots of organizations canceled their direct debits. And um, I don't know, just a straw poll, and put your hands up if something you had cancellations of direct debits. Yep, Steve Kershaw. Yep. So there we go. So that's that is essentially one of the things that happened. Lots of people put their hands up now. Um, that's essentially what happened. People started cancelling their direct debits to take back control of their outbound payments because they thought, well, if we do that, then we can manage our. Um, we can manage. I'm just I'm just letting somebody else in here. Uh, because uh, Sharon, Sharon needs to be let in. There we go. Um, so we, so they manage their outbound payments by saying, right, well, we can pay by banks. We can pay by electronic bank transfer. We don't need to pay by direct debit, and we'll we'll, we'll be able to do that in our timing rather than um, the direct debit timing. So lots of lots of stuff got cancelled. Now the the issue with that, of course, is is that if you've got the manual process in place, you've got to start 
re redoing it all again. So this is why organizations now are looking at automatic direct debit and paperless direct debit so that they can make their process more resilient. So priorities have changed. Back in the day, um, pre-lockdown, back in the good old days of, of 2019, um, we were in a situation where it was okay, the priorities were not in things like direct debit because the direct debit process, fundamentally it was clunky, yes, but it worked. Right. So there was there was less priority to fix that than there is than there is now. And because it's now clunky and because it's now um, not not resilient, that's why organizations are starting to look and think, like, how can we start to implement it? And we've got probably about half a dozen organizations that we've spoken to in the last sort of week or so that are actually starting these projects now. And some of them, um, I'm pleased to say, are actually on the on, on the on the call now. It is the, the 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 paperless direct debit is one of the one of the it's a, it's a process that you can implement relatively easily, um, and it's something that is that makes your overall O2C um, order to cash process more resilient. Right, as the back end of the process, it makes it more resilient for, to change because you can you can re-implement it and change the direct debits um, and get people back on board on direct debits much much easier than, than with the paper. So that's kind of where where we are now. So um, I'd like to introduce Charlie and tell you just a, very briefly a little, little little bit about her. Um, Charlie um, is an independent consultant and an associate of Chris Sanders Consulting, um, and um, um, I, I brought her back on board um, to, to, to help us to look at this for, for, for other, other clients. Charlie's background, she, she and I, myself, um, Pam as well, actually, we all worked in Shell International um, for a while uh, on, on a consulting gig. Um, and one of the things that, um, that, that Charlie put in place there was the Addis program within, 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 um, within Shell International. Um, and that was, that was an interesting and challenging project, as it happens. Um, not least because it's a pretty com complicated organisation. Um, Charlie is um, a, an independent consultant as well so she does a lot of work in agile um, at the moment she's on a, an assignment looking at, at socks she's also a coach as well so um she's one of these things called a scrum master and I, and I believe it's a jedi master or something in in something i'm not sure what it is but what your what your titles are but, but that, that's the kind of thing that, that charlie does so charlie does um process management process improvement and stuff like that and, and one of the things that she focuses on is paperless direct debit and um and and, and audis as well for for, for organizations so that's why we brought her back on board to help us with this okay so um i will hand over to you charlie so um all, all over to you now thank you Hi everyone. Right, so I will try and make, I'll, I'll skim through the first few slides quite quickly because I think everybody's quite um, aware of the, the benefits that um, Aldis as a, as a first pass and then paperless will um, deliver. Um, I've tried the process, as Chris said, is, is reasonably straightforward, uh, but there are quite a few sort of different permutations um, depending on your, your business, where you are in the life cycle, what your systems are like, etc. So I'll try and address um, some of those different um, scenarios, um, but then we can cover anything over in the questions at the end, or um, if it's very specific to your organisation, then we can do it um, offline at another time. Um, so as Chris has really already said, so direct debit is the preferred method of payment for many organisations now, um, and it's just a um, much, much easier way and more efficient to pay. Aldis is the, um, is the prerequisite to having paperless direct debit. And what we mean by Aldis is you, first, you've, you have to have a paper instruction in place. So that bit doesn't change. You still um, have to have the mandate physically signed by the customer. Um, but from then on, when it comes to you, you have to retain that um, yourself. So that's sort of the first, the, the, the biggest change. You retain it yourself. You're responsible for keeping that, storing it. If the bank asks for a copy of that mandate, you have to give it within seven working days. You need to be able to provide it. Um, but from then on in, any of the information um, within that mandate that is required to set up the, the instruction, you're extracting that information out yourself and then sending it electronically to the bank so that the physical mandate stays. So that's really what we mean by Aldis and the key, the key difference between that and a, and a paper. The benefits are, are, are probably quite 
self-explanatory, but far few man, um, manual steps in, in place, reduced processing delays, um, much quicker, um, much more reliable. Um, you've got an audit trail if things go wrong, um, it, it is automated, so BAX generates um, error reports, etc. And you've just got visibility, whereas, as Chris said, with a paper mandate, it sort of goes and you never quite know whether it's going to, to reach its destination or not. Next slide, please. Um, I think I've probably already covered um, that. We're, some of those bullets, when we go through the process, the roadmap, which is what I really want to focus on, um, we'll cover some of these points on here that are quite important. Um, so, for example, where we send them to the, um, we send to Bax Fire um, their, um, their preferred Baxter software. There are um, other ways of doing that. Um, and I think one of the ladies touched on that, that they found a bureau to do that for them. So that is an option. And when we go through the process, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that in further detail. Um, but yeah, in summary, faster payment, reduced paperwork, fewer errors all around, um, and more information to give to customers. Next slide, please. And then um, the benefits of um, paperless, again, probably speak for themselves, but once you've got Aldis, that's your prerequisite. You can't do um, paperless at all without that in place first. Um, and then having paperless allows you to collect the, um, the direct, you, you physically don't have to send any paper at all. You, um, you set it up either on the phone or, um, or electronically. And then when you're in possession of, those, of that direct debit, um, information then Aldis kicks in and you physically send the instruction um, electronically. Um, the result is obviously much better customer experience for the customer, gives them multiple ways to, um, to sign up, reduce paperwork which is really the goal all round. Um, there is fraud um, reduction um, obviously in terms of how you validate the onus for paperless is, is, is very much on yourself um, to be able to check that client to make sure that the customer is who they say they are um, and there's different software tools that allow you to do that. Modulus checking um, allows you to do the accounting, is a, an algorithm to do the accounting sort code. I'm sure most of you um, are aware of that or use that. Um, and then with paperless as well, there are also software tools called Know Your Customer, and that um, allows you to you know, actually make sure that the customer is who they say they are. Next slide, please. Okay, so the crux of the actual process itself now. So, so Aldis, so first of all, the very first step is to complete and submit an Aldis application form. Now, I'm assuming most of you are um, already have direct debit. So you'll have an application form set in place and um, you're probably familiar with, um, with the SUN, with the service user number. Um, but in terms of the actual direct debit process, so there's three ways of doing that. There's the standard direct debit instruction, which I'm assuming most of you probably have in place, which is the paper mandate. Um, and then there's Eldis and there's paperless. And for each of those, um, you, you ask for, you, you have an application form that you get from your bank and you have to actually complete the application form to be able to complete the direct debit process in one of those ways. So very, as soon as you complete that form, and I would recommend that you do it for Aldis and paperless, each, I think each application is about 200 pounds um, ago, but if you know at some point your, your goal is going to be paperless, then, then you may as well enable it at the beginning rather than, than just to do Aldis. Um, for, for those that are already on paper instructions, um, you do have a decision to make, and that's, do we have a brand new sun and migrate um, existing users onto that, um, which is normally the preferred, and e well, I say easiest, when you get to testing, you obviously have to make sure that that migration works properly and that you're not, you know, going to upset any existing um, direct debit payers. Um, but if you have a brand new, um, sun and you're putting um, all the others onto a brand new one rather than migrating them then that means that you have to physically send the mandate back out for them um, to sign so we, we don't really want to, to have to do that but once you've complete, completed that application form with the bank it takes on average between six to eight weeks to do that 
the, the second stage is then to prepare your systems, um, including software, to accept the new submission. So again, so at this stage, before you do anything, you have a few decisions that you need to make. Uh, so the first one is being, do you want to actually send the information yourself directly from your own systems? And that's using the Baxter approved um, software, or actually, do you want to have a bureau to do that for you? So that's a, a decision that you that you make um, at that time. And that actually does impact the service user number as well, because you can either have a direct son or a, an indirect son. So that's a decision that you need to make. And then you need to be able to prepare um, your systems. But essentially what you're doing is you're preparing the file to be able to send that direct debit um, instruction over to Bax. Now, again, there's another uh, decision to be made and, and really that depends on your systems and how advanced they are, but you have a choice to either, there's nothing to stop you manually extracting that information, um, would be quite clumsy and probably would depend on the size of the customer base that you've got, but nonetheless, you physically could extract the, the key information that you need from that direct debit instruction um, into a file manually, into a spreadsheet. Um, and then again, you either then input it into the, the backstool software or you, you simply send it off to a bureau to do that um, for you or, and probably the preferred method, certainly nowadays, is that the information is extracted out of your systems. So, um, and when I say information, that the file that you're sending um, to Bax, is, it has very specific ways um, of, of formatting that. So, you know, we can provide all of those sort of files for you, um, but there's very specific, you know, in terms of spaces and, and different, you know, like characters that you can use, um, et cetera. But the actual file, um, the, the key information that you're inputting in there is um, a core reference. So that's, that, that's a change. You have a core reference today um, with a direct debit instruction, but for paper ones, I think it can be as small as a two digit reference. For Aldis, it has to be between six and 18 digits long. Um, can be any alpha or numeric um, combination, but it has to be, it has to be unique. Um, so that has to be generated um, in the file, along with the direct debit information of the, 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 the customer details and the, the, the amount and the value. Um, the other change in there, um, that the key thing is the transaction ID. So won't go into all of the different data elements, but that transaction ID is key um, because, so for a brand new direct debit instruction, I think it's zero, well, zero N to say it's new, and then zero one to say it's the first one that you're submitting. Um, and then there's, there's various, various other numbers in between that, but um, those ones are mandatory and number 17 is mandatory, which is when you physically cancel. So that um, information itself has to be in that spreadsheet. So again, you have a decision to make. Um, do you um, change your systems to, to be able, and so the timelines of that process really depends um, based on are you going to configure your systems to allow you to put those codes into the system or are you going to generate it into the spreadsheet? Did you got, have a a... Question. got a quick yeah, question sure. for you, Charlie. Um, can the beginning of the process be made electronic, i.e. can the direct debit mandate form be sent to the customer electronically, signed electronically, and then returned electronically by email? Or must the customer provide a manual signature at all times? No, so, so, so this bit is, so before you do the paperless, so the bit that you're referring to is, yeah, is, is complete paperless direct debit. So once you've got this set up, so this is your first part. So first of all, it has to be, it has to be um, manual and you're sending it to, um, you're just physically automating the instruction to the bank. Once that's set up, then the next bit is um, your direct debit can be done completely automated online, but that's, that's okay. secondary Thanks. once Aldis is there. I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, I, I won't say who answered the question, but uh, if, if anybody wants to ask a question, please carry on. Sorry, carry on, Charlie. No, 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 that's that's fine. Um, so yeah, so that's that's really the big thing. There is is your systems. Um, how how set up are? How easy is it to? You know, most of these are just configurations um, in systems, and are generally nothing too too hard. But it does depend on your you know your timeline and your 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 internal process. Um, but as I said, there's nothing to stop you actually manually doing it. But but generally, it's is easier 
um, if you can do it in the actual systems um, themselves. And then once you've got the file, the rest of it really is all around your, your sponsoring bank and what they actually um, want in terms of testing. Um, as many testing cycles as you can, I would, would definitely recommend um, the success of it really is all around the testing and, you know, to make sure that the, the information gets there, the format is correct. We we'll go through some of the lessons sort of learned to, at the end and what to look for, but, you know, making sure that that data is correct um, is, is really key and, and oh, you know how to send it. Through. So are all banks um, equally as easy or are some more difficult than others? Um, some are definitely more difficult um, than others, yeah. Okay, if you were to pick the top three that were the worst, which would they be? Um, I would <laughs> say... Select people on the call. <laughs> well, certainly two um, spring to mind, and that would be HSBC and Citibank. Um, and I know some of the people I've spoken to actually over the last few weeks, um, I think they've all had a few nightmares with Citibank. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> There's Tracy Palmer nodding her head there. <laughs> Hi, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 I think some people just complicate it much more than it needs to. I mean, you know, I, I'm giving a lot of information here. And of course, there's lots of information depending on what route you go and your, you know, your, your source systems, etc. But it really isn't as complicated um, as it might sound. And some banks are very good at giving you the information and making it quite quite simple which one um, would you say is the good one have regular catch-ups um Bar barclays um i've had good right. experience with barclays i'm sure there's others and also over the years you know some of my experience are perhaps you know maybe a bit unfair because some of them are, are further you know things change quite quickly don't they so yeah, some of my true. nightmares for Citibank were probably 10 years ago but so having those, said that my yeah, conversations but, with people have been over the last few weeks equally as traumatic so those with, those with city banks should go and talk to their treasurer to sort of see if they can get changed over to barclays while they're doing this probably <laughs> yeah there may be some efficiencies there definitely <laughs> okay cool. um, to learn. so um yes it is all in the information and the process is is pretty much the same some some banks will you know want a little bit more information than others certainly when we get onto the paperless bit um they, they may be more more rigorous but some of them just i think really make it more complicated than it needs to be don't provide the information in a in an easy to way um easy to use way so that's something that we can, can certainly help with um, and then that's that. That's in in essence what Aldis is. And then you're you're free to then start using um, Aldis. Um, it's a much smaller uh, cycle. You, you can, in theory, once you have a new mandate, start. Um, uh, collecting after three days but we do recommend to wait five days because just in case a cancellation or something has has happened you want to make sure that you, you don't get a rejection so but within five days you you can start so that collecting cycle is is a lot shorter than with a paper mandate uh, unless any questions we go to the next slide okay next one Okay, so so you now have your eldest um, status, and you're 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 now electronically. So we've still got the paper mandate um, that we keep ourselves. Um, and when I say keep, it's either paper or it is um, it, it can be a scanned version as well. But you're responsible for that mandate. Um, you now happily going along with with that, and you see those efficiencies, um, and you decide you want to go to paperless. So. So you've got your prerequisite, you've got that all set up um, and that's fine. You've got your application form. So again, as I said at the beginning, do your application for elders and paperless. Otherwise, you'll have to at this point, if you're only eldest, you'll have to do another application for, for paperless. So it really does make sense to do both at the same time. And in terms of a process, really is quite sort of bank specific. Again, um, here, you do have to pass your um, bank's technical um, and financial checks, um, including having a, a, dem in, a paperless indemnity there. I think if you have one in place after 2004, I think the year is, then, then it's, it is valid. But if it's before that, then there's, there's work to be done on that, on that indemnity. Um, your, 
the materials it's very much because obviously a lot of this although you can do it over the phone you're normally doing it electronically so there's a lot of materials that you that you need um it's all there it's all the the, the backs the backs website stipulates what those um are so it's it's easy to um you know to, to implement the the scripts the telephone scripts the, the letters that you need etc but your bank has to physically approve all those all those things so their actual process what what they need what their timelines are, are are specific to the bank but the actual the actual um templates etc um, are all available um and then within that as well you do have to train your staff so backs have some you know quite basic sort of um training but it, it is good because it makes sure that there's a level of of consistency um available um like anything when you do on on um on the internet you do have to you know, keep log of all your you know, audit logs and uh, and everything, um, which are, which are you know quite standard really in terms of in terms of internet. But you do need to be able to track basically the amount of um, direct debit instructions that you're you know the amount of people on direct debit, the amount of um, cancellations that you get, the amount of queries um, that you get in relation to it, all all that standard sort of tracking you you have to be able to do. Is is it if you if you don't if you don't do certain things or you consistently do things wrong, then they can take you out of it, can't they? They about. can do that absolutely. Um, how yeah. common that is, um, I don't know, um, but yes, absolutely, um, they they can do that. It's, I mean, if you've passed it all, and that's why it's so rigorous in the first place, because um, so the the bank will um, obviously make sure that all these checks are in place, um, and that's why it is you know so structured for the paperless bit more than than Aldis, um, that these checks are there, and they will not let you do it unless it's it's there. So, but yes, so that's the hard bit, um, but. But going forward, they, they they can they can check and audit at any time. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and then the key thing here on paperless, um, as I mentioned um, further uh, earlier in the thing, is that your is your responsibility to be able to verify um, the customer is who that they say who they say they are so not just the account and the sort code but the customer themselves so the the fraud protection and there's there's many software packages um that um are backs approved that so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like when you're doing your electronic banking from home when you're tapping in a new payee then it, it comes up and says it matches or it doesn't match exactly exactly yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it, it's that so the, the modulus is just a, an algorithm and then there's yeah the, the, there's customer ones as well so right. um and then and then once you've passed the bank's paperless e-test you're then you're then basically um good to go okay so uh, another question. Any, 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 yeah, any questions? Let's have a look. What sort of timeline? This is from, uh, from from George. What sort of timeline would you expect this paperless end-to-end -end setup and approval take? Good question. Well, there's a very good question, and it, it depends <laughs> on lots of different things. That's the consultant's um, answer, isn't it? Depends. Yeah. Yeah, I know <laughs> it sounds a bit of a, of a cop out, but it's <laughs> but it is true because there's just so many different things in place. So, but for example, so the application form itself, first of all, takes six to eight weeks um so that's your sort of minimum time for aldis um i i would say typically it takes up to um up to four months um now so four months is your minimum because you could there's nothing to stop you doing aldis and paperless in parallel and at the same time so four months would be your minimum however i would generally recommend to do aldis first four months and then probably sort of three to six to do paperless but it, it really does depend on one how many customers you know if you're migrating everybody over you really want to make sure that you get that testing right so i would rather make sure you know you really spend a couple of months on that cycle of that testing so four to six months to become eldest and make sure that that process is really working correctly and then another sort of three to six months for the paperless side but again it really does depend on your systems because if you've got everything almost there um and it you know and, and your process to get things up in place depending on, on on what sort of processes um you have to get system things set up um then it could be quite quick but minimum four to six for everything 
as a whole, I would say six to 12 um, is about average to have everything end to end. And that's to ensure all the full testing and all of that kind of thing. But full as you testing say, it depends, and, and the changes. Depends on the maturity of where you are, what you've already got, what systems you have, the ability yeah. to interface. And then, and, and if you've got everything sort of hunky dory from your side, um, it, you're very much reliant on the timing for the bank to get. And your bank, of course. Yeah. And bank too, yeah. Okay. Another question for you How secure is the data held electronically from hacking? Well, I think that's just in terms of any, I, I guess the risk is, is, is the same um, as, any, as, as any sort of you know, company or, or process, but th this is a very, um, you know, that's why the process is so rigid and, and so you have to, you know, you have to, be able to follow certain checks. You have to have that modulus checking in place and the and, and the fraud check. So it is no less risky than any other sort of you know. But is that is that program. is that is this question you know is this this question to a degree is is how good is your anti fraud hacking software in your organisation? Yeah, it's no different. Yeah, so so it's whatever. What however good your systems are. Will determine how 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 easy it is for hackers to get in. So it's the same sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because you're just extracting the file out to send to the bank. That, that that's all you're doing. That's. Mm. That. Yeah. Okay. And and any any I think that's it for questions so far. Okay. Let's um let's let's talk about um um pitfalls. There we go. Yes, I think we've covered some of them along the way. But um, as I say, from from our our experience um, in other places timing is um, is essential um, and again it does come back to your to your bank but it is really critical to um, understand what the timings are with your bank all the requirements um, that they need that, that to have um, big you almost need like a I would recommend like a project manager because it's not that it's complex um but you do need to have things in place at certain times your bank will you know, some banks are brilliant and will ask for things um, and will chase you for them and others won't at all so you you know you really under, need to understand sort of the the end-to-end -end requirements in a in a in a project plan and understand the timings um allowed um needed around that um and just give yourself plenty of time to to do thorough testing as I say. Reference numbers um, as we mentioned for paper, for paper I, think, I think it's something as small as two I, I doubt many people do have two digits but that was the requirement back in back in the day um, whereas now Aldis is, um, is a minimum of six and can be up to 18 so this is your unique ID and it's really critical to you know to really make sure that that um, you've got the correct reference number. They really just check check the number, check it, and, and check yeah, it again. Yeah, one of the things that we found when we were doing this pre previously was we had a, an organisation that had um, lots of different divisions, and there were there were common account numbers. Yeah. The customer account number in the system was the same in two different divisions. So when you were doing the Audis and the paperless for for that, that you had to change one of them. I think wasn't wasn't that? Yeah, that's right. Because it has to be unique, and it and it would just yeah. cause problems. So. Um, thinking what the combination is 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 key first of all and then um and then um implementing it and and just making sure it's correct you, you know you really can't check your data enough. Yeah, the, the it team should your it team team should be able to help you do that i would imagine oh yeah yeah absolutely it's not that it's not that it's hard it's just being organized and having it in a in a plan to do it um again data issues so really just cleanse um Again, in lots of in, in many places, you know, you have lots of old duplicate accounts that are, might not be the case, but certainly with clients I've worked with, um, that there are old accounts in their old, you know, sort codes, account numbers, that sort of thing. So you really need to make sure that that's um, that that's cleansed first. Hmm. Um, and and as is, as as with any systems implementation. Um, uh, Data cleaning is, uh, is 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 absolutely critical. And when you're talking about payments, um, there is an out there is an outcome to this that if if the payment is wrong and it, it bounces to somebody else's account, it's one of those things. It's going to take. It's reputationally, it's a very difficult thing to, uh, to, to 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 do that sort of thing. So it's very very important to get that data issues right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then customer communication um, is really critically important. And in fact, one of the things I, I, I forgot to mention on paperless, one of the key things that you need to do is when you physically 
set them up either on the phone or, or electronically you have to be a you have to send them um, a letter to say that they're all set up within three working days now some people do that instantly and they print it off electronically um, but you need to send it to them within three days um, but nonetheless that communication to them is critical and if you are sent if you are changing their um, their reference number the direct debit reference number um, then they need to be able they need to know that as well um, again as Chris said you know reputational damage is you know, something that can happen quite easily without the well, yeah the if you've right got 75 percent 75 percent of your customer base on this and you get it wrong yeah, it's, it's not good, it's is quite it? a significant impact on your customers. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why some people probably just cautiously stay to, to paper. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, let's just not bother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then the last one, which sounds um, self-explanatory and, and, and is obvious, stakeholder and change management. But um, again, you know, if I've seen any delays, it's probably been centred around this. Um, touched on this with a few uh, people that I've spoken to as well over the last few weeks, and this has been true. So it's really engaging with everybody in the organization that needs to be part of this process because what you find sometimes especially in large organizations is people can often work in silos so they know they're part of the process but they don't know what needs to happen in in the next part so in one of the organizations that we worked for we we, we had a problem where everything was successful and Aldis was set up and was absolutely fine but when you send the file over, there were a couple of errors in that file, which is quite, you know, quite common and easy and, and, and easy to do because if you haven't got the instructions set up um, correctly or it's been cancelled or something. But what happens is that file is taken on mass. So it's either accepted or rejected. And obviously, if you've only got one error in 5,000 files you don't really want it um erroring um but there are always backup processes um within um you know your your business your organization that that you know that that would be there today that would allow you to take that error out um but it was really hard trying to understand the treasury process and who was actually responsible and it took a few weeks of back and forth the people saying no we don't we we don't know who who does that what do you mean you need to take an error out you need to call the bank no no that's not us and, and I was like I really don't believe that I cannot believe a whole file can fail um and when you found the right person in the process that did it it's like, oh yeah that's dead easy you just take that out you know job done um but without knowing that that could have caused a significant problem with Without, you know us keep you know going on until so one of the one of the there. tricks there then is is to make sure that you've got you've got everybody that is engaged in that process involved in the the, the changeover yeah absolutely and make sure that you know them. who to go to in, in 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 the event of things happening and, and have us have a steering board of people from those functions working on it yeah because yeah. you, you often find that these projects are driven by a department that obviously sees the value in it and, and, and other areas may or may not so so much. So yeah, it is important yeah. to get all stakeholders. Okay, okay. Um, got another question here. If you take DB forms at the point of online customer applications, how does the assigned paperless mandate reference work in relation to your customer account number, which is only known after you have the paperless direct debit mandate already established? Would our systems have to store and send the paperless reference, not our own account number? Yeah, so it's a brand new direct debit instruction reference that you would send to the customer. Yeah. For each customer? Yeah. Yeah, so it wouldn't necessarily be the account the, number. The account yeah. number. No, right. I mean, you could decide that it would, would could be the account number, um, but you'd have to you'd have to think that through as to how that would would work. But yeah, it has to be unique reference for every direct debit mandate. Right. Okay. Um, the other question here, um, can third party providers um, help to um, reduce the expected time frame for implementation? Yes, yeah, so, so one of the big things that you can decide is that you have um, a bureau that does it for you. Um, and when I say does it for you, you still have to input the information into a file. But if your systems were, were not so sophisticated, say, for example, um, then you could just, you know, extract everything manually, send them that spreadsheet, and then they will send it, it through the BACS approved software for you. Um, so that is, that's one way of doing it. Um, 
another way is if you have I know again talking to a few people over the last few weeks they have people that manage um, their sort of collection process um, for them and they are they already are eldest status and we sort of found that out by seeing some of the error reports that they that, that they get and it's like, oh yeah no you are eldest um but it's not them specifically it's not you it's 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 the person that you use to manage that process for you um so if you're already using that then that sort of fast tracks because if you're using eldest even if it's through a third party then you, you you're fine you're still set up for eldest and then you could go on to paperless so yeah you you could use somebody to to do that for you obviously there's you know efficiencies etc to probably be had by doing it in-house but if you're doing that anyway then yeah that's absolutely an option right okay so uh so if that is the case then um but you you you, you know the reputation if it goes wrong then you're the, still the ones that are going to get exactly it, yeah. absolutely, so, so it's yeah. the onus is on very much on you to make sure that whoever you're using is doing it right and you yeah. might want to yeah and so um as with as with all systems implementations it's always useful um, to, 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 to keep, the, keep the vendors honest about what they're doing and how they're doing it and make sure that you're comfortable with it and, and get some potentially sometimes some third parties to help you to make sure that they are doing the right thing for you. Okay. Yeah, you, you might want to do that. Or if you're already using third parties and you're you're now looking at, you know, and but you don't have Aldis or Paperless, equally it could be a time now to start looking at your, you know, your end-to-end -end process as a whole and you know what efficiencies do you want to make, what do you want to bring in, you know, mm -hmm. so not necessarily just Aldis and Paperless, but yeah, how you manage that whole end-to-end yeah process. yeah okay um, is, um so is, has anybody got any other any other questions that they want to ask while we're on i think that's the end of the slides that is that is the end of the slides yeah um how important is the adax report is it a legal requirement that it is worked do you want to tell so, people what the adax report is so this is this is um, when you have Eldis, it's to manage cancellations. Um, it's it's not. I'm pretty sure it's not. It's definitely not a legal requirement, um, but it is seen as sort of an added extra that helps you manage. Um, so it, it's just a report that you receive to manage those cancellations. So, but you should helps, you should be using if you get the report from it, you should. It helps that. you manage things more efficiently, but it's not a legal requirement, no. Okay. Um, would it would it um, would it be possible to make this um, presentation available to participants? Um, yes, because it's going to be on the YouTube channel, um, uh, a couple of YouTube channels probably. Um, so so yeah, the answer to that question, Adrian, is yes. Um, um, uh, hi Carson, how you doing? Uh, and uh, I've got uh, I looked into PDD for my company, B two B company, um, about two years ago, and I came across an issue was that our sponsoring bank made it seem as though the know your customer bit was almost a duplication of work um, It needed to be able to prove a company's details are in fact their own, obtaining bank slip of theirs, and that software costs to move through the credit reference. What, um, uh, and that software costs to, to prove this through credit reference agencies was expensive. Yes, good point. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, this is about um, this is about the algorithm thing and making sure that you know that you've got the right customer. Because we we when we did this in Shell, there was a cost, wasn't there? That we 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 spoke to, I won't say who it was, a um, third party customer information provider. Yeah. Right. Um, and in order to validate, you you had to get a check from them. Yeah, and, and that. So, do you still need to do that, or is there a cheaper way of doing it? I think Carson's saying. Yeah, the, there's different ways of doing it. The, the, the bit you're referring to is just the modulus bit. So, that's just the algorithm to check the sort code and the account number. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there are no your customer um, software modules. Now, what the bank, the, the complexity here is that different banks do, you know, have different things and standards that they will um, allow so it, it is a bit difficult but the the price of those different software models massively vary and there is a list of the backed approved ones so that would be my my recommendation is to get you know is to get the list of those backed approved ones um, and they they tend to be less pricey sometimes than some of the ones that the the banks recommend mm. and, and obviously some of the banks have you know the other side of it is you know if, if you, if, ones. the other side of it is of course if you if you've got an, a, a, you know a, a cost to these sorts of things you know what is the cost of not doing it potentially 
you know and that's that's something i mean we we do as, as we said in the in in the slide deck, you know we recommend that you use a, a, a checking mechanism to make sure that you do have it whether it be modelers checking or whatever it is um, but you do need to make sure that you reckon you do something that, that checks the customers as to who they are we know that in in at these in these times of um um challenging financial circumstances for many organizations and people should we say um you know that the, the instance of fraud um is is certainly a lot higher than it used to be so you have to think very carefully about what what you want to do and what you don't want to do and what, what omissions you're going to make but um, we would always recommend that you you double check that yeah and 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 i guess one of the benefits from from looking at it as a process perspective in terms of what that your end-to-end -end process is you know there's other savings to be made here so you know the fact that you've got the efficiency and that your timeline is reduced and you can collect earlier you know like some of those benefits and you, you can claw back some of the investment that you'd be using in software um in in other ways so having a way to measure so you can understand the efficiencies that you've made is you know is, is a good way of doing it as well okay Okay, um, any other questions from anybody? Let's have a look. Um, uh, oh, here we are. Um, are, are, the modulus, are the modulus checking services global or just UK? The, there are global ones, um, but the, the, the UK, the, the BACS approved ones are all UK ones, but there, there are some global ones, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's from um, that, that's from Jody. Um, and the question, um, another one. Uh, for those customers who do not wish to relinquish control, how would you entice customers to switch to DD? Hmm. So a more general, <laughs> a more general question. I remember when I worked for Cable and Wireless many years ago, one of the divisions um, was uh, the, the mobile, a mobile group. And um, the mobile business was actually owned by a chap that also owned a, um, a, uh, a, a wine merchant. And if you, and if you actually took out DD, then you'd, you'd get a couple of bottles of wine. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure. I don't, you know, we don't encourage drinking on CICM. <laughs> that's, something, that's something that they did, but that's a good, that's a good question. And, and it's, and it's always about that that's about you know a general question around direct debits and how do you how do you entice customers to do it so it'd be interesting to find out what other people have done to encourage um their customers to go direct debit has anybody got any any sort of thing they want to sort of volunteer or share with the group while we're on yep uh, i can chris when um hi nick hi yeah when i when we were at uh, certain builders merchants and we were implementing dd um we ended up um, putting a levy on for those who, so every new customer below, uh, I think it was 5,000 pound credit limit, had to sign, had, was automatic on DD. They didn't have a choice. If they weren't an account, they had to have DD. For the ones who we already had as customers, um, we put a levy on uh, for charging if they didn't have a DD, but also we tied it into a, a credit limit assessment as well. So yeah. we let them know that they got a three or 4% more if they were on dd than they were that's right and that's that's what a few people have mentioned here settlement discounts um different payment terms um change them from uh, dd uh, yeah charge them for dd payment processing um one percent settlement discount for dd customers 45 days on dd 30 days on standard that was a good one thank you sharon for that um our last company offered 50 50 euro discount or or of of free stock if they signed up with, with, with within a certain period, of course, it depends whether um, uh, what's what's if it's wine, yeah, go go for it, <laughs> or beer. <laughs> um, but if if you're a manure manufacturer, might not want to do so much of that. But yeah, so um, free stock, that's something. Um, it was it was wine. It was wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay, um, liaise with the sales team to add in the next pricing discussions. Yeah, that, that's a good one. When when you're looking at whenever you're looking at changing terms. Um, the things that credit managers then generally fail to look at is that they have an awful lot of levers in their kit bag that they can use. Um, to, and, and, and payment terms is one, and pricing could be potentially another, um, payment methods is another, um, discount, you know, if you're paying on direct debit, cheaper direct debits and stuff. We, we built all sorts of stuff into um, various types of customers when we were working in, 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 in another business, so that it depended on the, the, the risk that you were as to what payments, payment structure you were on. If you wanted to pay like that anyway, then you would get this discount you know all sorts of different things that you can do and there, there is an awful lot that credit managers can do um it's just that they generally don't sort of think about it liaise with the sales teams 
um, to add it to the next uh, pricing discussion. Yeah, which is which is a good one. Sky, I believe, if you don't pay by DD, I think you have to pay by DD now. But I remember they used to say it used to cost you an extra couple of quid um, to 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 have their their, their service. Um, um, uh, if you if you didn't pay by direct debit, I don't think it makes any difference because there's still nothing on telly anyway. Um, so, um, uh, any, anybody else else got any any other questions? So, some quite a lot of good ideas on that one, which is which is terrific. Anybody got any other questions? Okay. Um, right. I'm just going to put this up here. We we have put together an industry briefing note, um, which um, is is available, um, and it's been put together with um, it's supported by our friends from from Atradius. So thanks thanks guys. Um, so if you want a copy of this industry um, briefing note, please drop an email to inquiries at chrissandersconsulting.com, inquiries at chrissandersconsulting.com. Um, also, if you want to have a chat with Charlie, again, ping an email to that address there. Um, and, and she can sort of spend a bit of time, sort of have a chat with you and ask her any other questions that you may have on this. Um, and there are, um, and, and uh, we're providing various sort of support packages for clients. Um, we can talk about that as well in, if, if you want to um, on that. So, um, uh, so yeah, so um, so inquiries at Chris Science Consulting, if you want a copy of this, I'm also going to be posting it onto the um, onto LinkedIn as well. Um, if, if people want to, you can also ping me on LinkedIn if you want details of this. Of this note as well okay so um so thanks very much for that i'm uh, i'm 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 gonna uh, i'm gonna stop the recording now and stop uh, stop sharing the screen okay there we go i'm gonna stop recording now so if you want to st stay on and continue to ask charlie some questions then you're more than welcome to so thanks very much indeed charlie for your time today you're um, welcome to the deck um and, and everything else that's, that's really useful i think there's probably going to be loads and loads of questions coming yeah. out so thanks very much this particular um session will be uploaded onto youtube um probably early next week um, and it'll be pinged out on LinkedIn um, when everybody when when it's on there, so you can you can watch this again and share it with your teams. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now. So thanks very much, everybody, for joining.